Uh, the first time I've ever spoken at what I'm guessing is an IMAX, so this is a new experience for me. Um, my name is Frank Cifaldi, and uh, I believe the, the name of the talk in the, in the program uh, is Behind the Scenes of Digital Eclipse. Does that sound about right? Um, so yeah, I work sometimes uh, at a video game studio called Digital Eclipse. Uh, we're known for um, re-releasing older games in these sort of compilation packages. And what we try to do is um, treat these things like like a uh, like a sort of collector's edition like Blu-ray. Like what would the Criterion collection be for video games, right? So we try to not just like bring back these games in a way that's nostalgic if you remember them. We, we try to go beyond that. We try to, to sort of educate you about like how these games were made and, and how you know people thought of them at the time. And, and um, we do things like dig up original concept art and, and show it to you to, to kind of show like the making of these games. Um, so yeah, I technically do do that. Um, but you know, I've, I've talked a lot about this stuff and, and uh, I, I think there's a, a more important talk to have. So we're gonna have this one instead. <laughs> Is anyone objecting to this? Because we can, we have a Q&A at the end. You can ask me about digital clips all you want. Promise. Okay. Let's talk about saving video game history instead. Um, why should we save video game history? Um, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, I've been archiving the history of video games uh, for about 20 years now, since about 1999, um, in, in various forms. I started off as a... Uh, I guess you'd call a, a sort of ROM pirate. <laughs> I was one of the guys who was actually taking data off of like Nintendo cartridges and putting them online. Very, very illegal. Um, and uh, it's just always kind of been my cause. Uh, so, you know, why? Like, why do we save this stuff? I, I mean, you guys are here. Obviously, I don't need to tell you the video games are cool, that they're culturally relevant, that they can uh support this crazy show that i just I, this is my first time here by the way like I can't, I can't believe how cool this show is um like obviously this stuff matters this stuff impacted all of us you know like we because it's it, the nature of the medium right of it being such an interactive medium like these things really just stuck with us and and shaped us not only as individuals but as a culture i would say um and I think that uh, we're sort of in danger of losing where these things came from and why they mattered and why we played them and why they were important. Um, and uh, so, you know, obviously we should save this stuff. Um, so <laughs> I've heard this so many times. It's like, save video game history. It's like, okay, let's just collect all the games, right? Like, like every time people want to, I don't know, like, I wouldn't be surprised if someone in this room has thought with their video game collection, I'm going to turn this into a museum, you know, and it's, it's, it's something I hear over and over again. Uh, and it's, yeah, you know, let's, let's get all the games, right? Let's collect every box game ever and, and put them on a shelf. This is a national video game museum, by the way, in Frisco, Texas, this photograph. Uh, if you're ever in the Dallas area, please go visit them. They're amazing. Um, so it's, yeah, if we have all the games, we just have all the games. Now we can tell history, right? It's like, Okay, yeah, sure, we have the games, but then what, right? Like, what do you get out of a game that is history? Um, this still is from a, a video series uh, by Chris Kohler. It's called Complete in Box. It's like, okay, if you just have a game, right? Like, you just hand someone a game. It's like, what can we extract from this game, right? Like, you can... You can you can extrapolate how it's played by playing it. You can you can see how it looks and sounds if you're uh, if you're really good at being in a story and you and, and you have the the box and manual you can sort of extrapolate things like oh you know nintendo marketed super mario brothers in this specific way right and you could start telling narratives about that um if you're uh if you're a hacker type you can maybe start dissecting the code and learning things that way but my point is that there's only so much you get out of just having a game and and i think we need to think beyond that um, and also emulators exist. So every historian I know, myself included, you know, we don't, we don't need to access like a museum's library of video games because we have the entire library of video games. It's just on the internet. We can just grow, go grab it whenever we want to. Um, so, you know, the, I, I think this notion of uh, just collect all the games and, and have them and then we saved history, like I think that's, 
a very small percentage of, of what we need to be doing uh, collectively if we care about the vid- history of video games and we want to save it. Um, here are things you can't uh, extrapolate typically playing a game. Who made the games? I mean, some games have credits. Most of them do now, but Super Mario Brothers certainly didn't. You know, who played them? Like, what did people think about them back then? Uh, how were they sold, right? Like, uh, you know, how were they, like, marketed, for example? Like, did did uh, Nintendo advertise Super Mario Brothers on television? Uh, no, they didn't. Um, you know, wh- was where was it sold? Like, we was it sold in you know, retail stores? Was it a mail order thing? You know, these are the kinds of things you don't get by looking at a game, and so you lose the context of that game. Um, you know, what did people think about the games, right? Like, that's an important thing to know if you're trying to understand the history of that game and why it maybe succeeded or failed. Um, and, you know, what else was happening in the world, right? Like, uh, you know, if, if you're not aware of, of you know, the, like what was going on in worldwide politics in the 80s, you might not understand why a game like Contra exists. You know, if you just see Contra in a vacuum, you know, you, you uh, I guess Konami just thought of, shirtless guy with a gun no that you know they were watching rambo they were seeing what was going on in the world um and these games just lose context if, if we're not sort of capturing all this ephemeral history around them as well uh, in addition to the games themselves uh j- just as an example i mean we always think of you know et is like the worst game ever right like like it, it it's it's so bad that like they made a documentary about how bad it was and and it's just it's this totally false narrative that has persisted uh because people don't tend to go beyond just playing the game and like hearsay and if you actually go back and look at the reviews of et it it was it reviewed okay and like in electronic fun with computer and games magazine for example that month, E.T. wasn't even the worst game. They, they gave Gorf a lower score. We don't talk about how Gorf is the worst game ever. You know, we talk about that for E.T. Um, but, you know, based on internet, just internet discourse, and uh, you, you wouldn't know that unless you went back to these old ephemeral materials like these magazine reviews. Um, another good example with magazines um, was uh, Earthbound. Uh, you guys know this game, Earthbound? Uh, I didn't capitalize the B. I'm really embarrassed by that right now. The editor in me is screaming. Um, so Earthbound is a JRPG from Nintendo. Brilliant game. You play it now, right? If you just play Earthbound in a vacuum, you're like, this is pretty good. You know, it's it's a slightly old-fashioned RPG. It's But it's, you know, that we all... I mean, for the most part, we've all decided that Earthbound's a good game, right? Like, that, that's, that's, that's sort of the collective take on Earthbound. But... Objectively, it was a commercial failure for Nintendo, and ultimately, I'm pretty sure that's why we never got Mother 3. So why did it fail? You know, a lot of people blame the marketing of the game, but, you know, if you were to dig up every review of the game that was written at the time, and I did, um, then, you know, some patterns start emerging. Um, Nobody liked the graphics, which is crazy to think about now, because those graphics, I mean, the game's beautiful, right? So... You know, they didn't like the graphics. Uh, they thought it was a little bit old fashioned. They thought it was like a kiddie game, like it was it was aimed at children. And so, for the most part, the review scores were uh, pretty bad, except for a game fan down there really liked it. Apparently, with the the nineties and ninety twos. But you start seeing people like almost every review complained about the graphics. It was they they were too simplistic. It looked like an eight bit game. It was for kids, um, and. If you, again, if you think about the context of what was going on at the time and, like, the see what else the magazines are talking about, this is 1995. These journalists are, like, playing PlayStation games already. You know, they've got a PlayStation in from Japan. Everything's going 3D. Um, when, Super, when, when Nintendo actually showed Earthbound at a trade show, um, I believe it was Winter CES 95, um, they had like Star Fox 2 with the Super FX chip and like Comanche and whatever, FX Fighter. Like they had all these, like even their Super Nintendo games were in 3D. Everyone was, everyone was going toward this more like, you know, mature polygonal future, right? And here's just like charming little Earthbound in the corner of the show. So like, of course it failed, right? But you don't know that by playing it. You play it and you go, oh, it's a good game. But if you understand uh, the history surrounding it, if you're able to like dig up you know all the magazines that talked about it and understand the discourse around it you're able to start start telling these narratives and 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 
really, I'd, I'd say even changing the narrative that's out there. Um, because, you know, there is this sort of narrative among the EarthMap community where it's like Nintendo's marketing failed, right? Their marketing was bad on this thing. I would argue that it was impossible to market EarthBound at this time. No, this is not a game anyone wanted at that time. It was just either ahead of its time or came too late. Um, so, you know, where where do you get these things, right? Like, like if, if you wanted to do this kind of research as an historian, how do you do that? Well, let's, let's go to the library, right? Let's go to the library. Libraries have everything. They kept everything. So, uh, again, Electronic Fun with Computer and, and Games is the magazine I referenced here with ET. It's like, well, let's go check out that magazine from the library. Here are the two libraries in the country <laughs> that have any issues of that magazine. Two. Two libraries. Uh, Strong Museum of Play, by the way, an, another great place. It's in Rochester, so if you guys are from around here, you got no excuse. Uh, go visit them. Um, and then the only actual, like, regular public library, it's not even a public library, it's a university library, Michigan State. And if you have, were to happen to go to Michigan State, they have two random issues of this magazine. <laughs> they have volume one, number two, and volume two, number five. So, like, you can't just go to a library and research this stuff. Um so, you know, a lot of these magazines are, are scanned online. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's sort of the next best thing, right? It's like, well, let's, well it's not, I'd say it's the first place you should go. You shouldn't go to a library for magazines on the Internet. It's stupid. Um, but, you know, people have been voluntarily scanning these magazines, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, Retromags is, is the, the biggest group. It's retromags.com. They actually uh, they very bravely uh, sacrifice these magazines in the name of digital preservation. They chop the spines off so you get the proper scans and everything. But even then, it's like we don't have very good coverage of a lot of things. Like here's, you know, the first year of uh, Tips and Tricks magazine. It's like one of the first six is scanned, period. Um, hilariously, I just picked this one up on the show floor, number one. Um, the other, you know, these other four, the other, other five are not. And like, we don't even have, we don't even know what the covers look like you know, for like three of these. It's, this stuff is just, it's ephemeral by nature. It's disappearing. And boy, did tips and tricks like Mortal Kombat 2. Um, so I run a nonprofit called the Video Game History Foundation. Uh, that's me and my partner, Kelsey Lewin, um, who is giving like this exact same talk right now at a Phoenix con, which is great. Um, and, uh, you know, our, everything that we do at the foundation is we, we believe that uh, historians, if they have access to this sort of ephemeral material, to the marketing, to the magazines, to like developer interviews, and maybe even like the source code for the games is sort of the big dream, um, that we can start telling more interesting stories than we can currently. Um, you know, this is just how it's done in all other aspects like when 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 historians write books about i don't know abraham lincoln right they're they're able to access like a library's collection of lincoln's like correspondence and that's how they start you know you, you start mapping all that stuff out and you start telling stories based on that that's how it's done we don't have that notion for video games right now and it's frustrating um so that's why we founded the the foundation um uh you know, and and we just we have this fear that is I think very founded fear. It's not unfounded that material like this is rapidly disappearing. That um, you know the uh, magazines are the example I gave, but it's like material from developers, right? Like o older developers. I mean, you know, we we've when Ralph Bear died to me, that was that should have been the wake up call where it's like, hey, we're not immortal. <laughs> You know, like like these older developers, you know, they're they're not getting any younger, and you know they might have a box of of incredible material that that we should be archiving. We should be immortalizing these people now while they're still around, uh, especially from that earlier golden age of video games. Um, and and I think, you know, I think it's too late for a lot of stuff. But if if there's sort of a collective effort among all of us to to really focus on, like, no, we need to start capturing this material while we can, uh, then we're, we're going to end up saving uh, a lot more stories and, and frankly, games than, than we would uh, just by relying on the pirates like we have been. Um, so uh, we do a few things. Um, on the left is uh, I've started building out 
um, well, I should I started. I've been building this thing for like 18 years. Um, we, we we've been building a reference library of video game magazines. Um, where I mean I'm literally still moving these things in from storage, so we're not like open yet or anything. But uh, perhaps soon we'll be the third library to have electronic fun with computer and games. If you search WorldCat, um, we focus a lot also on uh, digitizing data from from rare and ephemeral sources. Uh, so on the upper right there, um, we're digitizing a lot of like press material. Uh, that was sent to the magazine. So things like, you know, trailers would be sent on disc or, or screenshots or, or fact sheets. Uh, and it's, uh, that, that's our, that's our, I don't know, that's set up. I'm still amazed that we pulled that off. So like, those are six machines that you can feed a hundred discs into at a time. And we wrote custom software to where like when it's done, it spits it out and then a webcam hovering over like takes a picture of it and like associates it. It's really cool. Um, but, you know, one of our the point being that one of our focuses is, is on sort of solving um, these 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 needs that the world has like, hey, uh, and this is from Game Informer magazine, by the way, they, they, they invited us to our office to their office to uh, help them digitize their press material. Um, you know, they, they had years of this stuff just sitting there um, that was literally rotting on CDRs. So, you know, there's not really like a strike team out there to like come uh, rescue that data yet. So like we're trying to do that. And then the other thing I'd like to think that we're kind of good at is uh, being able to rent a van real quick <laughs> if, if stuff goes down. Um, so that is, um, that, pr that picture in particular is, um, when the U.S. office of IDOS um, was uh, finally uh, vacating and they were about to throw all their stuff away. And luckily I had a friend who worked there who called me and we were able to rescue a lot of their marketing material. Um, they would not let me take any of their um, like prototype game builds because, uh, I don't know, <laughs> lawyers or something. But uh, you know, we were able to rescue a lot of interesting things. Um, a Tomb Raider standee is signed by the whole team, which is kind of cool. Um, and it's not just us. I mean, like, I don't mean to come across like we're this giant solution to all the problems. We're not. In fact, we're basically two people with uh, no funding. So we're not a solution, but uh, not the solution. There, but there's a lot going on out there. Uh, I mentioned the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester. Um, these guys, has anyone been there by chance? One person in the audience. That's all right. Um, these guys uh, have been around for a really long time. They're a museum focused basically on like the nature of play, like toys and 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 uh, things like that. And they started taking video games seriously, I think, in 2006. Um, and their collection at this point is really astounding. Um, like they, like when I showed the that WorldCat screenshot earlier, it's like they have a collection of all the video game magazines. They have, you know, a, a really good collection of the games themselves, and they've been. Uh, more than anyone, I think, collecting uh, the personal um, archives of game developers. Um, so one of my favorite collections they have is uh, Jordan Mechner donated his material. Has anyone played Karataka or Prince of Persia? Like yeah. So um, so Jordan, if, if you've played those games, uh, you probably realize the animation's like crazy smooth and it's because he was he rotoscoped his brother. So like he videotaped his brother running around and jumping and climbing on things. And like, you know, he still had those videos. So like you can go access those videos at the Strong and like his printouts that when he'd like photograph the TV and like trace the sprites and stuff, like all that material's there, all of his like handwritten notes and sketches and things like that. And so if you were to want to write like the book on Jordan Mechner and, and who he was and, and what his games were like, you know, you go here and they start pulling out boxes for you. Um, they have some other good stuff too. They have Ralph Bear's papers. They have some of Will Wright's like around like the Sims and Sim City era. Um, uh, Doug Carlson who ran Broderbund games back in the day, like he kept a copy of everything and he just sent it all there. Um, so point being that there's other archives out there. Uh, National Video Game Museum, I mentioned earlier, The Maid. That, those are basically the three video game museums in the country that I know of. If I'm missing any, please let me know. Um, but there's, you know, there's the, the idea of a video game museum is starting to become popular, uh, not just here, but around the world. They're starting to crop up. 
Uh, some university archives uh, are also collecting this kind of material. UT Austin in particular, they've got um, uh, Warren Spector's work from like Deus Ex. And, and I think Richard Garriott sent a lot of his stuff over there as well. Um, and then like real grown up places have, have started collecting video game stuff too. Like the Museum of Modern Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum put on an art of video games exhibit. Um, the Library of Congress a few years ago was like, hey, wait a minute, we should be collecting video games. So they started doing that. Um, and I think, you know, maybe even more so than than these stuffy institutions like mine, there's, you know, the the sort of people on the internet who are doing the real work, who are like, you know, finding rare video games and digitizing them. So there's uh, all kinds of stuff like that. I mentioned retro mags earlier, scanning the, the magazines. Um, and then uh, something that I think gets overlooked pretty often in, in terms of like preserving history is uh, the actual authors who write emulators are like, to me, this is voodoo. You know, they're taking this physical object this like computer and they're they're like reverse engineering how it works and recreating it on your computer like that's really important work that that i don't think it's talked about enough in terms of like what preservation of video games is um you guys want help no no one wants help that's okay um but if you did decide later that you wanted to help <laughs> like there's a lot of little things you can do that aren't like yeah, I, I get asked pretty often at the foundation, really, like, how do I help? What do I do? And and my answer is usually like, can you give us money? If not, I don't really know. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a lot of little things that like aren't super sexy that you could be doing that is helping to preserve uh, video games. Um, you know, if you have things like if you have a collection of boxed games, uh get a flatbed scanner, scan them, throw them on the Internet Archive, uh, archive.org. Like you can... I don't think people understand that you you can upload whatever you want to this thing and it's there forever. Um, so there's some groups who are, you know, buying out like lots of like crappy Wii games and taking out the inserts and like putting scans on the internet so that everyone can access that kind of stuff. Um, you can join the community. There's uh, when I say the community, it's it's right now it's just this bunch of disparate little pockets everywhere, which is a little bit frustrating. There's not really a home that everyone goes to, but. You know, there's discords out there. We've got one. Um, the VGPC, it's a video game preservation collective, has a really active one. Um, Gaming Alexandria, these guys are. Um, that's where you want to hang out if you if you're if you're into like scanning things. Um, uh, Redump is another small thing you can do, which is that these guys are validating the data from discs and it's really just a simple thing you follow the instructions if you have a bunch of ps2 games and a disk drive on your computer you know it's just like go to redump see what needs validating and just all you do is like put in your disk and run a program and like it spits out a string and you like and you copy paste that string um and if you guys know someone with with rare material if you your uncle made sega games or something you know like start encouraging uh, them to think about like how how is this stuff gonna outlast you you know like how do you do you want to be immortalized <laughs> you know do you do you want to be in an archive um, anyway like I I usually do these talks uh, sort of Q and A heavy and um, I'm pretty sure in this beautiful round auditorium that I I'll be able to hear you guys if you want to yell out um, so. Let's talk about this. Like, typically, people have a lot of questions about like what's going on in preservation or how to help. So, what do you got uh, in front first? Do you feel that there are certain things that are almost on the verge of being completely lost forever? Uh, the question was, do I think there's stuff on the verge of being lost completely forever? Um, absolutely. Uh, if you're okay, the stuff I'm most worried about. Like, I'm not worried about games that were sold on physical media in stores like that stuff i'm not worried about i'm worried about the iphone games from 10 years ago you know like i don't i don't think there's ever been a concentrated effort to capture that data uh as it was coming out so uh and you know these a, a lot of those early iphone games don't even run on iphones anymore because when apple switched from like 32 to 64 bit operating systems developers had to update their games to run and work isn't free yeah so like if their games weren't popular anymore they just abandoned them you can't access these things and uh i don't think the the so typically like 
you know, if you're like, I want to play a Commodore 64 game, it's it's typically on the internet because the pirates were on top of it. I don't think the pirates were necessarily on top of the, you know, hundreds of iPhone games that came out every day. Um, and I'm not saying that, I don't know. It's like, yeah, maybe we can't capture them all, but like, what are we missing? You know, what, like what, what important games, like, like what important author of the future like made a crappy iPhone game that's like part of their story that is gone forever and that's just iPhone i mean god like think about games that are just online services right like how do you the the example i always give is farmville you guys know farmville you remember farmville like how do you save farmville like farmville is a game that you know exists only on facebook or whatever and like has to call to the servers and and like you can't like download farmville and now it's farmville and even if you could like how do you recreate the environment of playing farmville you know do you like clone your aunt who is like you know like giving you requests on facebook like you can't like preserve everything that is farmville so um so i worry about stuff like that too and i think i and 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 I think we need to sort sort of start rethinking what it means to save a video game when we talk about stuff like that. Because I don't think we can think about Farmville the same as we can like Sonic the Hedgehog, right? Like Sonic the Hedgehog, it's like there's binary data on a cartridge. You get it out. That's the whole game. Farmville, it's like we, I think we need to start thinking about it um, more as an experience that needs to be documented, right? Like it's it's maybe more like how do we preserve a game of uh, I, I'm stealing this from uh, John Paul Dyson at the Strong because it was such a good analogy, but it's like how do you preserve a game of baseball, right? I, I think for a lot of these games we start need to start thinking about it that way and like actually capturing what they were through audio and video and stuff like that. Um, I think I saw one up here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the question was essentially what's being done um, to capture memories, right? Is that, is that a fair way of, of yeah, so like, like how do we capture the people, basically? Like, like, like not just the materials that came out of their work, but how do we sort of capture who they were? Um, I, I do think that um, there needs to be, there are some really good oral history projects that are happening. Um, there's some good podcasts out there with people uh, who are, are uh, finding game developers and interviewing them uh, on a regular basis. Um, I believe it's MoMA, uh, Museum of Modern Art, actually is starting to uh, uh, conduct oral history interviews with game developers, with people who, and not just developers, I think to your point, it's like to, with marketers, with people who were uh, um, around. But uh I would say not enough essentially, but like, I think that's true in any medium. You know what I mean? Like, like to me, video games is what I care about. So I'm like, no, there should be more oral history, but I think we're probably about as healthy as like Hollywood at this point in terms of people going out and doing it. Um, but you know, that's, that's something that, uh, in the sort of like, what can you do camp? It's like, there's so many people who are just kind of like, on LinkedIn who worked on that crappy game that only you care about, <laughs> you know what I mean? That whose stories have not been told. And it's like, that's a fairly simple thing to do is just start having conversations with people and capturing them and publishing them somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, like the foundation itself, we're not doing too much of that because we're just so small and focused on, on building out the archive. But uh oral history is super important. And, and if you're doing something like writing a book, right? Like it's, it's those memories that are going to color most of what you're talking about. And, and so, yeah, I agree with you that, that that's very important. Uh, yes, up there. So what is the, the the question is what is the future of uh Okay um so what is the future of like representing the old games to people yeah um I think it's I think it's crystal clear that that uh 
the the retro gaming is a thing, right? <laughs> like people like playing these old games. We are all at a show about these things, um, and you know, I don't know, like like what we try to do at Digital Eclipse, I think, is a little bit different than uh, uh, what most people do, and and it's hard for me to predict, right? Because like I, you're asking me to predict how how, how people are going to start reselling these, and it's like when I saw those those mini arcade cabinets i'm like who the hell's gonna buy these and then everyone did <laughs> so like I'm, i don't know if i'm a good predictor of like the market of, of older games um do i think more people are gonna do what we do at digital eclipse um yeah and i've started to see some of it really um like i i don't I, maybe this is i'm full of myself here but i don't think konami would have like put all that attention that they did into those Castlevania collections if people like us hadn't sort of set that bar. Um, but I don't know. I, like, I, I would like to believe there's a future where, like, our vision of of classic games being these sort of interactive coffee table books that teach you, I'd like to think that's where things are going, but I don't, I don't think the general public cares all that much. You know what I mean? Like, I... <laughs> Like I miss DVDs having all these bonus features and stuff, and you still see some of that, but it's like it's really, you know, it's like we just watch things on Netflix now. We don't care about how they were made. We just want to watch the thing. Um, but that said, the what I'm seeing a lot of lately that I love is there's a lot of like books coming out lately. Like Boss Fight books started up, and and they're doing a lot of sort of history books about individual titles. Um, there's a uh, there's like three or four publishers in the UK who are just killing it right now with, with like these big, like full color books about like the Oliver twins. Do you want to read this giant book about the guys who made dizzy the egg? Like they got your back. Um, and, and uh, I, I don't know if that's necessarily answering your question because I think it's like the stuff that I want to do inside of a video game. I think we're starting to, we're, I think is being comfortably done on, paper and, and other inferior mediums. Uh, <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes? Uh, yeah, how, how do you see the publishers changing all this? Like, how, how has your attitude changed since you started out here to Virginia? Like, I'm wondering, does Activision, do they keep the source code of, like, Colt and Thor because of culture relevant? Like, yeah. Nintendo gave up, you know, like, how, yeah. how does the publisher think about preservation and, and or, like, the Hollywood studios where it's like, yeah, this is Sure. That no, that's a really good question. The question was how, uh, you know, what are my observations about like how how game publishers are are feeling about preservation, about saving their own history, um, and and how has that changed, right? Um, I think that um, a lot of the actual source material. Uh, do you, when I say source code, do you guys generally know what I'm talking about? Uh, okay. So the, the actual building blocks of the game, right? Like you like you can't from the from the the retail game you can't actually like go into the code and see what was written and how the game works you can you you can sort of extrapolate that data but you're inferring you're not directly reading it um a lot of that older source code is actually gone like most of the source code from the 80s and 90s uh was not well kept in a publisher archive and it's it's literally the same thing that happened to movies in like the 20s and 30s right where there wasn't yet a market to sell these movies a second time. Um, so in the 20s and 30s, you make a movie, you sell it to the theaters, they run it, you're done. There's like, there's no such thing as home videos, not even TV, you know what I mean? There's not even television sets to play the home videos that don't exist yet. Like, and and uh, you might be able to like sell the movie again later, but for the most part that didn't work because people understood that like that's an old movie. Um, so a lot of, I think it's like, what's the film foundation's stat? It's like 90% of films made before the thirties in the U S are gone forever now. Um, and, and I think the same thing sort of happened with source code for the same reasons, which is like, you know, you're making a game on the Sega Genesis and super Nintendo or whatever you put it out and it's like, well, <laughs> that that's done. Let's move on. There's no reason to save this. Um, and so a lot of that stuff is gone, but there's remasters all the dang time now. And, and in fact, you know, we also have a market now where games, you know, have content that supports their continued existence. Um, and I think that the publishers have gotten a lot better uh, at maintaining their source because there's a reason to do it. There's a financial reason to do it. Um, 
And yeah, exactly. Storing it's a lot cheaper now than, uh, you know, maintaining like tape drives of hard drive backups and stuff like you would have had to do in the old days. So I'm not super worried about, um, I'm not super worried about the existence of source code now, like the modern stuff. I am worried about like, how do we get to a place where we can look at it, where we can learn about the games that we care about by, by actually like going inside of them and seeing how they work. Um, and that's, for the foundation, like that's something we're actively working on. That's like like. Yeah. It's really actually it's the exact opposite of what you just said. So um, Nintendo will ne like. Um, I think Nintendo understands their place in history, but they're 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 always just a forward-looking company. You know, they don't. I'm. I say that while they're like releasing old games on the thing or whatever, but um, the, the thing, the switch, uh, <laughs> that, that thing with the games. Um, but you know, they're, 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 they're typically not interested in uh, putting in the work to make, you know, material beyond the approved retail games available to historians. Whereas EA um, actually, we've had really good conversations with them because they, um, they have an internal group. They have an archival group internally, um, which I don't know if any other publisher has, but EA has an archival group and there's like four or five people on it. And they're the guys who like when your project's wrapped up, they're like knocking on your cube and they're like, cough it up. <laughs> like whatever you have, cough it up. We were going to store it. Um, and they've been doing this. I think it was one guy's initiative. His name's uh, Stefan, I believe. Um that he started like 25 years ago. He's like one of the old timers at EA. Um, and they actually have a really substantial archive and they, they like, you know, started calling older developers and they're like, Hey, do you have the work that you're not supposed to have? We won't tell anyone, <laughs> but did you steal company property? And if so, can we have a copy of it? Um, and so they've been sort of backlogging their stuff and, um, and, you know, a lot of it is for commercial reasons, right? They might want to re-release Hard Hat Mac or something. They're never going to re-release Hard Hat Mac. But, you know, they, like there's commercial reasons for storing this stuff, but it's also like they care and they want people to be able to access this. And they haven't opened up any video game source uh, yet for people to look at, but I don't think it's impossible um, because they actually did donate, um, I think it was to the computer, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it was to the Computer History Museum. Uh, they donated the source for Deluxe Paint, which was uh, the graphics program that like everyone used for a really long time on Amiga and DOS. Like any any tile art in, in like the, the the 90s, pretty much was done in Deluxe Paint, and that and that source code is now like something that a researcher could go access and look at. Um, and so I think that that is a company that potentially. I could see like allowing a researcher to actually access their material or even, you know, starting to donate some of that material or even open sourcing it. And in fact, uh, they did, um, th there is a project where the original Sim City uh, engine source is out there uh, with EA's blessing. So you can actually like tinker with it and you can see how Sim City works and you could even make new games using the engine from the original Sim City, which you shouldn't because it's really old now, but um, but like that, they've shown an initiative and, and, and that they care. And really the only hurdle is uh, a, a legal barrier at this point, I think for a lot of this stuff getting out there. So um, so yeah, not only am I seeing modern publishers, uh, you know, do a better job at actually like archiving their projects when they're done and storing them, um, they're also, you know, at least in EA's case, like they're starting to understand that like they should be saving this stuff because it's their company's heritage. So I, I actually feel very hopeful about about the future of that stuff. Yes, in the corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, what do I think that um, people 30 years from now will be looking back on and wanting to access, right? Yeah. 
Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Like we're gonna look back at, at like cyberpunk and be like, look at this garbage. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, because tech is constantly evolving. And um, like, is is the question more like, what do I think is gonna be like culturally relevant specifically? Like, what what games do I think? Be? Yeah, okay. Um, I think. <sighs> I, I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that people are going to be talking about Nintendo 50 years from now, right? Like, I, 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 I think that a lot of the sort of other stuff, you know, might be forgotten. But, um, you know, Nintendo is something that I think, uh, at least at, at the foundation in our archive, that we, we focus on really heavily. Like, we're starting to actually, like, talk to people who worked at NOA. And, and you know, it's the same conversation that, that the EA guys have when they call. It's like, did you steal stuff? I hope, please. And the, can we have it? Um, but it's just things like internal company memos and things like that. Like you think about, I think about Nintendo. Like I think, like people think about Disney. I think that's the the, the best uh, analog for Nintendo, right? Where it's like people obsess over like, you know, the like how people like painted the prop wall at Disneyland. You know what I mean? Like like that level of obsession is is true of Disney, and I think of Nintendo also. Um, so something that we focus on a lot is just, you know, like finding weird little internal company newsletters and things like that, that they had in the eighties and nineties and, 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 um, understanding the culture of working there, what it was like to be a gameplay counselor, answering the phone when kids called and stuff like that and, and sort of capturing Nintendo. But, um, outside of Nintendo, I mean, like, you know, if I could predict the future, I'd be rich. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of really obvious ones, right? Like, um, Fortnite is a phenomenon that like is, is always going to be, uh, either like the heralding of, 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 of something, or it's just its own game in a vacuum, right? Or Minecraft, right? Things like that. Um, what's that? I miss Tower of God. Yeah, <laughs> I do too. Um, but you know, it's also for us, it's this constant question of like, what should we be focusing on? Should we be the judges right now of what the future deserves to look at, you know, or should we, or should we be, you know, should we be like spending our energy, like identifying the things that we're sure are important and focusing on them? Or should we be like spreading out and getting a little bit of everything? I don't know. Uh, so we try to find that line and it's really hard. I think there was, yes, green shirt. Two questions. Sure. Um, so let, let, let's just limit it to like console games, right? Like uh, just to make it a little easier. Um, so what the question was, what is the preservation of, of console games like in the future when when these games are constantly being patched and updated, right? Um, I My hope is that, again, the pirates will save us, <laughs> you know, because that's how we saved a lot of this data. Um, realistically, I don't know if that's true. Give me one second. Um, I don't know if people are necessarily capturing all of the individual patches and like versioning games and, and making sure we have all the updates. And to your point, it's like, th I think there's this very real fear that like 30 years from now, a lot of these console games, it's like, we'll have the build that shipped on the disc, you know what I mean? And not access to the patches, which as a developer is horrifying because the crap I put on the disc is like, you know, that's like a month before we're done typically is what's on the discs yeah yeah day one patches are like that's I, I will tell you as a developer it's like i count on those i don't want you playing on my unpatched game that's embarrassing <laughs> um so yeah so i don't it's i mean it's a it's a big question right it's a big question there's not really an answer for and i think that the closest we can get to solving that is starting to encourage industry participation in saving these things um you know we're we're not quite there yet but um you know we're in a good position to be where it's like i would like for example just spitballing but like maybe microsoft should have you know library accounts that get to have all of the builds that come out and all the different versioned uh patches and things like that right like or, or um or maybe, you know, 
start encouraging someone like a Sony or a Nintendo to uh, um, allow people to uninstall patches even. You know what I mean? Like like to, to go back and forth. I think you could do some versions of that on Steam, but um, it's – it's not necessarily a solvable problem, but uh, you know it's something we're definitely thinking about a lot. And um, uh, he has one more question, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Question was: You can find box art pretty easily. What's well, a good website to find manuals? So the scanning a thing front and back is pretty easy. Scanning a book sucks. <laughs> And like not a lot of people like doing that. Um, so is there a website that really captures all the manuals? Not really. Um, you, you know, like when I'm, when I need to do that, it's like, I happen to know that like, Oh, Nintendo age is pretty good at NES stuff. And then the Atari stuff is pretty well covered on this obscure Atari web. You know what I mean? But it's like, I don't think there's a really good repository of those manuals. And um, if if the follow-up question would be, what do we do about that? Then um, my stance has always been try to get all that paper at least in one place first and we'll figure it out later. Um, so that's why we're building that physical library instead of me spending all day like scanning magazines. Like, let's just get them all in a house. Um, and I think this is sort of the same thing for manuals. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry. Um, yes? Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, is there concern for preserving the original hardware? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not a museum guy. Like, I'm not trained in museum sciences or anything. But, you know, I always think back to, like, I spend a lot of time at the Computer History Museum, and they have um, – they have a PDP-1. I think they have the only functioning PDP-1, which is the 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 uh, the computer system that at MIT uh, that uh, Space War was written on, basically the first video game. Um, and uh, yeah, actually, what's crazy about it is that the guy who wrote Space War still volunteers there on weekends. So like, you can go play the first video game with the guy who made it, and it's just for free right now. Um, but, you know, what they do is, you know, they have to go to crazy lengths to make sure that, like, all the original pieces are intact. And, like, if they can't use the original parts, those parts are, like, cataloged somewhere in storage. And um, the way it was described to me with, with, with their hardware was that they'll never do this. But, like, if, if, if an old piece of hardware comes in and it's not working, they need to make sure that at any point they could rebuild it back to the state it was in when it came in. Um, and I think that, you know, if, if a museum's thinking about video game hardware, I think they have to start thinking about it in those terms. And that, you know, that gets a little bit scary with things like arcade games, where it's like, I guess we have to preserve the crappy Williams power supply from 84 instead of it replacing it with a thing that actually works, you know? Um, but, um, yeah, maintaining hardware, yeah, absolutely. That is something that needs to be done, and that, that is... Uh, that is a perfect function of a museum, right? Whereas I, th I think us common folk can can uh, can uh, can change the world in other ways uh, th that they can't. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the question was, where do, where does the Video Game History Foundation's funding come from? Um, mostly, it is small recurring donations uh, from members. Uh, you know, we, we take donations on the website, just, you know, swipe a credit card through, through, through Stripe or whatever. But um, the bulk of our donations is actually uh, Patreon. So Patreon actually has a nonprofit funding model, um, which is, it's weird that I don't see more nonprofits on Patreon because it's, it's literally like, you know, when you listen to NPR and they're like, become a sustaining member. It's like, Patreon just does that, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's where the majority of our money comes from currently. Um, in terms of like, cause it's, it's like, we don't make enough to like pay me, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's not a lot of money, uh, through that model, but, uh, um, you know, the, I mean, I could, I could talk your ear off after this if you want about like different funding models for nonprofits. But, um, you know, there, the, I think that you start, you need to, we, we need to start figuring out like who our like larger donors are and going out to talk and talking to those guys, you know, it's, I don't think it's necessarily video game executives. Like my hunch is that it's more like 
tech bros in the area who grew up with games, <laughs> you know, who were like, who got good VC money, um, things like that. But uh, yeah, that's where most of our funding comes from is on Patreon. Um, we do have a Patreon. If you guys like, if you guys use Patreon, uh, you get things like discord access and stuff like that. Um, and uh, come come hang out with us. We have a Bubsy channel in our Discord where we just t- yeah. If you want to talk about that stupid Bobcat, um, but yeah. Uh, other questions? Okay, I got two. I'm gonna start here. So you you you. I think we have time. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, great. Yes. Or, oh right, it was you. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. So the question was, what do I think of Let's Plays in terms of preserving history, like their role in preserving history? Um, yeah. Th- and that sounds great, but it's like it's it's really hit or miss, right? Like in terms of like whether a Let's Play is actually going to educate you, or if they're you know if it's going to be like annoying guys farting on the microphone, you know. Um, I don't think anyone literally does that. But <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it's it's especially like a uh, well, okay. That said, like I, I think those are both important or could be right because it's like um, a will, really well researched let's play through a game is like probably the best way to really understand that game better than a book or whatever because you're actually seeing the game but at the same time I think there actually is some importance to someone blind playing a game for the first time um, especially one that's harder to access because it's like um, you're capturing what it is for a player to play a game for the first time and you might even be able to extrapolate you know why it didn't do well especially if it's an arcade game right like uh oh it didn't suck the person in right away so why would someone keep spending quarters on this um i think that um and this this could be a whole other topic i think we're not doing a great job of capturing uh the cultural zeitgeist right now around games like we're not doing a great job of capturing streamers you know of 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 of, uh of of capturing the way that people interact with games right now right and like or like capturing actually there was a good project to capture i remember the name of it the nintendo wii u thing where you could draw pictures and post to the whatever that was the like what was it meverse yeah like capturing meverse and stuff like that um but uh yeah i think let's plays are, are really important to not just understanding history but i think they should be captured as part of the history too because like this is a cultural mo- moment that's happening right now that that's a really popular thing to do uh and and uh i would hope that a lot of that stuff survives and like i don't know if, if you guys ever watched um i can't remember the name of the youtube channel but there's a guy who uh goes through the history of of a speed run of a game and and like goes through all the world records that have happened over the years and it's like watching that's really eye opening cuz it'll be like you know this run happened in 2006 it was a world record at the time we have no evidence of it anymore <laughs> you know what i mean and it's like that's kind of scary too um i think there was one up here there's you yeah Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Ted. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I don't know if I've seen too much in my research, like capturing of the like the memories and the workflow of the actual people who did the localizations necessarily. But um, there's a guy he goes by Tomato. His name's Clyde Mandolin. Uh, works at Fan Gamer, who does a series of books called Legends of Localization. Um, and I think what he does is maybe even more interesting in that he is explaining why localization decisions were made based on 
his understanding of the original Japanese. So he's done one on The Legend of Zelda, and he did one on Earthbound, and he's done a couple that are just like not game specific but general. And he has a website too, and uh, you should look him up if you're really interested in um, how localization was done in the old days and how it's changed and stuff like that. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, I, I I think it's worth sure, you know, like capturing. Uh, uh, so I mean, actually, we do have some localization files in our archive um, that I, I don't want to spoil, but they're really cool. Uh, <laughs> we're working on an article right now. Um, I saw one more. I thought, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, do you feel like it's important also to use this history to teach children like strategy or storytelling mm. or um, some type of learning mechanism? where like new games now it's so virtual reality it's like you're plugged in versus old games where you were like you know you're in a spaceship somewhere doing something yeah. very odd that you wouldn't see in games now do you feel like it's something so is, is the question is the question is it important to teach children like like literacy in older games like like have them play older games is that the question like or children today like they're eight years old playing games from 35 years ago yeah you know like is there something to that for possibly in the future um i'm not sure i understand the question in terms of the question was like uh, is there anything uh, should we be like if you make a history of these games yeah is it relevant to children now growing up oh okay i see what you're saying yeah i mean it's like you know, it, like I had to read Catcher in the Rye in high school, you know, and it's like, it's, yeah. Um, and, and I, and I do think that, yeah, there, there is some learning to be done, uh, by playing gaming's past, especially for children who are into games now to sort of understand where these games came from. Um, you know, and, and I, it's, it's just like any person, right. It's like, there's certain type of people like a lot of us in this room, I'm sure who are like interested in sort of like, uh, diving in and understanding things and, and understanding where we came from. And some people just don't care and they just want to play the new thing. But, uh, I do think the video game literacy should be taught in the classroom. Uh, you know, maybe not required, but there should at least be an elective, right. That, that makes people play monkey Island or whatever. Um, I think we're out of time. Is that right? Oh yeah, I, I could do probably one more question. Yeah. Ooh, what can we expect from Digital Eclipse? Um, uh, we have announced a project. We announced it like three, four months ago, which is uh, Samurai Showdown collection, um, and it's the uh, all the Neo Geo specifically uh, Samurai Showdown games, um, and boy, I, I've not been involved in that one. Um, I've I've sort of been stepping back to focus on the foundation and 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 uh, and letting the rest of the team uh, handle everything. But uh, I don't know what's been announced or shown, so I don't know how much I can say. <laughs> but but uh, I think it's called Samurai Showdown Neo Geo Collection or something like that, and it's it's the Neo Geo games. And uh, there's definitely some really good behind the scenes stuff that we got for this that. Um, it's probably more than we've gotten for the other projects even. So I'm pretty excited about it. I think I can squeeze you in. Yeah, real quick. Yeah. So are our publishers reaching out to Digital Eclipse now that we've done a few of these things and, and, and asking uh, us to work for them? Uh, sometimes uh, and and often, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's also like, you know, I've had so many times where we've had conversations with publishers and, and gotten pretty far and gotten pitches going and then um, they kind of disappear and then the project gets announced by someone else <laughs> you know, sort of thing, which is really frustrating. But um, I would say that our projects have open doors for sure. Like like publishers are understanding our names and everything. But um, I think ultimately in a lot of cases that – um, I don't know that the market for these retro uh, re-releases has matured enough where uh, a lot of publishers want to take the financial risk to do the real work that's required to do these the way that we want to do them. Um, and, and I think that in a lot of cases, uh, they'd rather be risk averse and just kind of put the game out there and, and just let it stand on its own. Uh, 